I guess before I get into this, uh, I would like to just do a couple of things. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, FGrow for supporting this project. I believe it's an important project, and I guess you guys will be the judge to tell. Um, the other one is I'd like to thank Yang Wu from the Four Corp uh, for the independent numerical testing of and validation of the forestry functions that were embedded in this tool. And I'd like to thank the Alberta government for providing me uh, inventory data for testing the AVI functions, uh, which are the inventory functions. Uh, and I did have to sign away my first point for that one. Uh, you know, it, it was, I had to sign essentially an agreement, which means that uh, just 10 minutes ago, actually I was gonna provide some data on AVI, show some AVI data, and then I, I decided not to because, because of that agreement. And secondly, um, I just want to point out that this is not a software course per se. Uh, I will go through some of the basics, uh, but details are provided in the user's guide. So uh, I'll try to use my time mostly to discuss just a kind of a general sense of, of why this is important and, and, and where it's going and what the possibilities are as opposed to trying to go through um, just a software you know, course. Um, and in case, in case you guys wonder about the moniker, the Excel is consulting, um, I guess it goes back to the early days of the internet when I was part of an expert group. Uh, I think it was called about.com back in the day, uh, providing basically voluntary services to people around the world regarding Excel in my case. And one of the users called me the Excel whist, so that stuck. And, um, and I had a company and I just decided to keep using that, uh, you know, for, you know, pretty much for the last 20 years, 20, 25 years. And so today's topic is bridging the gap, the forestry tool add-in for Microsoft Excel. And um, I guess the overview, just in terms of what, what I'm gonna be talking about, I guess the first thing is what is it? Uh, the second one is why do we need this? And especially why in Microsoft Excel, and what is an add-in anyways? Like uh, probably a lot of people don't necessarily know what, what an add-in is. And I'll provide some demo regarding installation usage and some, I guess I call them apps, the small solutions that I developed pretty quickly using this add-in. And I guess it's providing some insight in the future where this could be taken next. Um, so first of all, what is it? Um, the first toolbox is a collection of useful forestry models and functions that are directly accessible from within Microsoft Excel. And, and there are embedded probably about 25 functions and various pro procedures um, that you can access through Excel. And when I say Excel, I'm talking about Excel 2010 plus. So that's like 11 years. So uh, if you have, earlier versions of Excel, you probably should be upgrading anyways. And it does work on both 32-bit uh, and 64-bit installations of Microsoft Office. So there's no limitations regarding that. Um, and why? Um, I guess the best answer to that is to hide complexity. Because, I mean, frankly, a lot of these functions that, that we use in forestry could could be pretty complex. And, and I guess math is very important, but it could be bloody complicated. So, um, I mean, I just leave it here with regards to one of the equations that were, was implemented. And I mean, probably most of you re recognize this function as, as the taper equation. And as you can see, this has like, what, nine coefficients. And there's this little x here that I guess the authors couldn't really capture, so they had to kind of write out underneath. So, so this is a long equation, it's just one of them. And, and if you want to calculate three volume, you have to go through some iterations and all sorts of other things. And so because of this complexity, um, I guess that's kind of one of the main reasons. There are several others, but this would be the main reason. And the source for this particular cutout is from Xiaoming's 1994 taper equations um, publication in Alberta, but to be to give credit, it actually is from Kozak 
1988, who invented essentially the taper equations, uh, the, this form. And Kozak happens to be also Hungarian. Uh, that probably explains a lot. Um, people who might be on this call from Saskatchewan, they, they might also recognize Gal and Bella, who were also calibrating coefficients for the taper function in, in Saskatchewan, who are also Hungarian. So we slowly take over that, that field for whatever reason. Uh, so why, why there, there are other, several other reasons. I mean, one of them is that I've been working for SG in Alberta for about 25, 30 years now, close to 30. And uh, forestry has become progressively more quantitative. Um, and I'm sure you're aware of that, uh, working every day, uh, especially if, if you happen to be in Alberta. The forest management planning process is becoming highly technical and detailed. So that means that silviculturists and forest planners and alike, uh, any forestry professional now, you know, has, you know, kind of have to reach into a lot of other fields or details that, you know, were considered outside of the realm of our profession. So you have to be a little bit um, in, into like real database management softwares or understand relational databases or work with the geographic information system and, and those kind of things. Um, we also have the ability to collect large amounts of data. Now, this is a good thing. I mean, obviously with LIDAR and everything, um, but it also means that we have the ability to collect large amounts of bad data. And, and I guess that's one important aspect that if you are a domain expert and you have a large amount of data, um, you're removed from the data collection process like you used to just go out and collect some PSV data and you knew that your data that you collected. In this case, that's not, you know, you're removed from that process most of the time. So you have to have the ability to somehow review or, or look, look for issues uh, or pick out issues in the data if possible. And Excel is a good tool for that. Um, and, and, you know, most people are familiar with Excel. There's also sophisticated modeling techniques uh, that people use. Um, but of course, machine learning is coming with regards to, you know, all, the, all this LIDAR uh, information, individual trees and, and whatnot. But a lot of the functions have become more complex simply because there are the tools and computers and technology that, that allows that and there's publications. And I guess that's one of the other reasons, main reasons that I, I think it's important uh, to have some tool that gives, you know, access to this is to extend the useful research. And, I guess Alberta is lucky in a sense that I, I think we have probably one of the top forestry scientists in the world in Xiaoming. And, and he's probably publishing 10, 15 papers a year for the last, whatever, 20 years. Uh, it might be exaggerating a bit, but, but I, I think it's close to the truth. And, and he's done a lot of uh, pretty complicated stuff uh, that's published in peer-reviewed journals, and it's good research. And but because of the complicated math, um, it's somewhat buried in technical lingo and papers, and not really accessible to forestry people. Even if it would be very useful to have have access to that information, um, there's also lack of expertise, and that's just part of, you know, I, I mean, in my experience, that's just part of the the fact that. Uh, you know, technical information or people with high level of technical skills, analytical skills, don't necessarily view forestry as their, as a sexy kind of area. So they would go into engineering and forest software development or even stuff like drug, re like research and, and analytics. And so I guess that hopefully will change with the introduction of growth and yield share and Robert can, um, Gather or, or 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 you know have some people who get interested in this, especially because it you know forestry is highly technical and there's this large amount of data, as I said, and there's machine learning and a lot of other uh, technologies that are coming in and lidar, like you have the drones, you have lidar technologies, you have all sorts of uh, forestry equipment, and so they all require uh, people like a, a new breed of analysts who can work with that data and understand the domain as well. And, and we need those people. 
And so this admin tries to remove some of the key barriers to forestry data compilation analysis. And I guess force a level of standardization. And that, that just simply means that, um, I guess if you, if you look at the US versus Canada, for example, um, I mean, they haven't even got to, in Canada to, to agree on one standard list of species. Um, you know, uh, so black spruce is called SB in some provinces, BS in others. Um, you know, in, in the US, you have like a list of numbers and all numbers rep represent a species and it's kind of commonly shared across. And it's very important. And I, I guess the users do have, um, you know, some creativity to bypass those standardizations, but one number generated by, you know, across the board would be, you know, like a one consistent number for regular tree volume, for example, would be very useful. Um, so, so these are kind of the reasons why in Excel, and I guess Excel is one of the most popular programs of all time. And, and I guess people, you know, people know that because you use it probably every day. Uh, by, based on my experience, foresters love Excel. I mean, most professor, forestry professionals readily use Excel and have very good working knowledge of the software. And so you build an existing inv investment uh, quick and cheap prototyping. And I think this is one of those, those things that, you know, if, if, if you work in under, any other area than forestry, it's still the same challenge. You are the domain expert, you understand your domain, uh, but then you, you don't know, you know, for example, you want to create a forestry data collection program or a racket cruise that you just want to use. A lot of times it's going to take you potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop programs. And Excel is great at prototyping these ideas because you don't know the domain and the domain expertise is much hard to, harder to obtain. And, and because of that, uh, I mean, you, you could develop some, some of these tools in a matter of days and use them and, and you're not necessarily uh, uh, you know, attached to that particular program. If you spend a half a million dollar on a program, it's highly unlikely you're gonna Change, change it because it's going to cost you a lot more money or it's very unlikely you're going to scrap it and do another one because it, it, it just costs a lot of money. So being able to do that in Excel and prototyping it uh, is, a, is a useful thing. An Excel formula is, is a language that's most widely used programming language in the world. I just learned that actually just a couple of days ago. I didn't know. Um, no need to learn scripting on Python or learn new tricks. Um, you already have an investment, uh, your IT already approved the software, so you don't have to you know, obtain another one and try to install and deal with it. And, and if you can use the sum function in Excel, you can use the forestry toolbox add-in. So what's an Excel add-in? Um, essentially, in a short way to say, it, it's an extension of the functionality of Excel. And you'll find it already because if, there are built-in native functions in Excel. And so, for example, if you happen to develop something in Spain, uh, in the Spanish version of Excel, and you send it to a colleague in, in Canada, they can open it in, in the English version of Excel and it will understand the function names, which of course are different in Spanish, because there is some uh, converter that's already automatically installed the moment you open Excel. There are also web services that, that are possible, which essentially are, you know, you need obviously web access to that, but, but it provides you some ways of function, extended function to Excel. So for example, if you have an address book or address database in Excel, you can get the zip code, um, uh, you know, for any kind of address that you have by tapping into app service and returning it in, in a cell. Uh, there's also uh, what they call dynamic link libraries. Uh, these are essentially a fancy way of saying it's just compiled code of functions. Um, it's a great way of dealing with things um, because a professional programmer can compile you a library that can be then linked to many other things, not just Excel. Um, a couple of examples that, that Albertans will 
recognized. One is the uh, Mixed Growth Model, MGM, that does have essentially a piece of that that's, that's linked to an office um, library. So that's, that's one particular example. And the other one is the Gypsy Model, DLL, that Excel Gypsy is using. And in both cases, it works great, but you also have to register the DLL to the system and you know you have to deal with installation and other issues that that potentially can you know cause cause problems so, so that's also a solution and then of course there's the custom add-ins which fpbx the forestry toolbox is one of them is essentially just just providing uh, an extended function with that right within excel so the forestry toolbox uh, is being used in my kind of view is that you have a building block of forestry functions. You have some level of sophistication by the user, so it will work even if you're a beginner, but also, of course, it works really well if, you, if you're an advanced user of Excel. And you have some creativity sprinkled in there, and you can generate some custom solutions. So I'm gonna branch out to, to provide some level of demonstration, hopefully, I can do that. Uh, so I just have Excel open and, and installation. And as I said, everything is pretty much in the manual. Uh, but I'm going to kind of go over very quickly on a couple of things. One of them is how to install this. So Excel add-in that I provide or, or, or is provided, you can download from the website. And uh, you can place it in a, pretty much any folder of your choice. It doesn't have to be a particular place that Microsoft likes. You can pretty much put it anywhere. And under options, uh, file options, you have this button that essentially is, is, is your add-ins. And under add-ins, um, this is what shows you an active add-ins that you already have installed. And if you want to install this particular one that you just received, you go under manage Excel add-ins, go. And through browse, you could browse to the particular folder where you, select, you know, where, where you save your add-in, in this case, the forest toolbox, which I already have installed right here, and you can select it and then click OK. And the way you know that it's installed is that there's going to be a menu icon called FTBX right on the top. And so this FTBX right now is slim pickings in a sense that um, it only has three buttons. And of course, there could be many more. Uh, but the idea was to as I consider this phase one to kind of just demonstrate how most of the useful functions can be embedded and then go from there and see if people see the, um, you know, see the light, so to speak, and, and they see ideas or, or see ways of expanding it uh, even further. So there's an about button, which will just provide you some information of the versions and, and whatnot on the, on the add-in. And then there's something here called Piggy CSV, which of course, Alberton, Foresters will recognize, um, probably other people may not know what this is. It's essentially, Piggy is, well, that's how it's pronounced, Piggy, uh, Provincial Growth Initiative. It's a set of CSV files that Alberta converted most of their PSPs into this one format, and it's being used for model calibration and whatnot. And of course, one of the issues with this, it has strict standards to them, but it's, uh, it could be quite challenging to format the data so it comes in um, in a standard way so it, the computer is accepted. So I wrote this some time ago and I just included it here as one of the processes where you can open a CSV file from Piggy, there are eight of them, and it will recognize instantly, checks for structure and formats the data and, and all that. And there's an options button, which right now will not provide you much, but I will talk about this Essentially, this is retained retain for future customization by individual users, and I'll get there, uh, what that means. Um, so the embedded functions, as I said, there's 23, I think 23 functions in there, and most of them are, in fact, all of them are in the manual, but I give you just one example here, just kind of what it is. So all the function names will, will include the, you know, I guess the, the prefix of FTBX for forestry toolbox and underscore. And in this case, this particular function is based on the Gypsy model. You can calculate the site index. And description is shown in, when you're using that, and you will see 
when you use the function, you will see in the function builder that it actually tells you what description, you know, what it does. So in this case, it calculates the site nets from the gypsy model. And then it gives you the arguments. And most of the arguments will be self-explanatory in terms of names. But it also provides you what the function expects. So, you know, in this case, it requires a species code. Um, it requires top height in meters. It requires some sort of an age that could be best height age or stump age or total age. And it could return, uh, which is optional, you, you can return based on an index whether you return a site net's total age, the best height age, base site nets, which is the default, if you don't provide the number there, or years to reach best height, years to reach stump height, which are all embedded in the model. And in this case, I just provide the reference to the particular uh, model that was this was based on. Um, so yeah, so these, these are essentially, um, you know, information that appears on information that appears on the, you know, on on, on the when I use the function themselves. If I go to, uh, you know, I guess try to out some of the functions. So generally speaking, what you would get is you would normally use it in a context of some sort of a data table where you might want to calculate some numbers and. Um, so I just set it up um, as a very basic, simple data that in this case, you have some natural subregions, you have your species code, which is pine, and you collected some best height age and diameters at best height. And you want to compile this data to a particular merchantability limit, which in Alberta is expressed as minimum stump diameter, diameter over bark, top diameter inside bark and stump height. This is in centimeters, this is in centimeters, and, and these, these are all in centimeters. And in this case, um, I just kind of show you a couple of examples of how it's being used. So if you want to embed a function, in this case, uh, the first thing I do is if natural subregions provide us a, a three letter code, this is lower foothills, um, you select the cell and you, you have several options. One of them is just there's this insert function button that in Excel. If you click that, uh, you can select a category, and the category in this case is FTBX, which is usually the last one on the list because anything custom will kind of show up there. And then once you did that, it will show you the available functions that are, you know, that are that are embedded in this add-in. And in this case, what we are after is uh, called FTBX um, NSR number. So. If I click that, it will show you that it's it's essentially uh, you know requires an NSR code, and it will look up a numeric code for the Albert Natural subregion. So, um, if you click OK, then you can put in your NSR code. And as you can see here, it will provide you a description, look up numeric code for Albert Natural subregion. So that's what it's going to return, and it will require a two or three error code for NSR code. So in this case. If you provide that, it will return 11, which of course is the number numeric code for lower foothills. If you didn't have any heights collected, uh, it's possible to use the latest versions of, I think it's Shaming's research and, and, and some Shaming and others from 2016 that are published in Alberta. And those are, again, you can access it the exact same way uh, if you use the, you know, this this box, it will already go to go there as your most recent one, so you don't have to do much again. And you can search for something called height from DBH and do the same thing. Again, it's very, very, well, after a while, you must use it. It will become very familiar. You have some arguments you have to fill in. It will tell you what it does. So it will calculate three height in meters. So you provide the species and then you can click or use the tab to jump to the next one and requires a number for natural subregion. It tells you right there, natural subregion number. So, okay, we'll need that. And it requires a DBH in centimeters. And you select that. And then once you did that, it returns your predicted height and in, in meters. And so um, I guess most people will be interested in how it's being used for growth merchant volume. So I'm going to show that one. Um, you know, as, as, as just an example, because I know that a lot of people, that was one of the biggest stumbling blocks that people did not 
who could not really implement uh, calculation of merchantable volumes. And, and in this case, um, they're going to be using FTBX underscore merch volume. And it again describes the function and its inputs right down there. But if you click OK, it will provide you a function list and you know argument list, and you can you can basically provide the information. And because it's a table, you kind of do it for the first row and then you can copy it down later on. So select the species, the letter code, you need the NSR number, you need the DBH. Um, you need the height. And at this point, as you can see, without providing any more information on the input, which is you would need the utilization limits for that tree, it already provides your number 0.2753 cubic meters. And, and that would be, if you clicked OK, uh, that would be the number. Uh, but of course, this is based on a, a standard utilization, which is 15, 10, 30, which is not necessarily what you want. Um, or you want to tie it to precure fields. In this case, you want to tie it to these cells. So you can, if you change the cell, then so that's you know, the number. So if you click FX again on, on that cell, you can um, essentially provide that information by you know, selecting the cell minimum stun diameter over bark, which it says optional, and default is 15. But if you link, if you want to link to that cell, so you, later on you can change it. That's the way to do it. And then you can provide your top diameter inside bar and stump height in centimeters. Again, everything is described here in terms of descriptions. Everything is built right into the software. And if you want to provide minimum merchantable length, which is in Alberta usable length, which is defaulted to 3.66 meters in this case, I'm going to leave it at that. We could have included that in the list, but we didn't. And of course, the number will not change because it's at 15, 10, 30, which is the default. But if you change this number now to 11, obviously it will change. And so, and then you could, I didn't include the site next, but it, it, it works exactly the same way. You can copy it down by just, again, selecting the cells that are next to each other. You have a little uh, black arrow or sorry, a cross. And you can just drag it down and there it, there it goes. And if you change any of these numbers, if you have, let's say, central uh, or sorry, central mixed wood, uh, then so do the numbers change, uh, obviously. And, and so it's all volatile. That's what the Excel term for it. So it, it will change as you change the numbers, which is what you want. Um, there's also, as I said, there's 23 functions. I'm not going to go through all of them, obviously, but uh, some of the stuff that you can do is, uh, again, it's very Alberta-based. So, for example, if you have your AVI data, and this is a standard AVI inventory file, uh, you can calculate your AVI strata. Um, I already did that for this one. It essentially just returns your uh, base and strata for the Alberta government. And as I said, uh, they provide me data about 80 million records. And uh, I use that for testing. Everything will work great. So, so um, you know, this this is this is this is not one of those things that is pretty complicated to program every time. And and even if it looks simple in the programming because you only have ten strata, it's actually bloody complicated because of the issues of overlapping species or you know two species belong to the same group, all sorts of things. So you 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 quickly can become, you know. It, it can become very complicated to program it. So having one consistent way of doing this would be the way to go. Mm -hmm. And right now, this is all self, you know, tested and, and, and provided. And I have over or so because there's two layers in the ABI and, and one, is, one is called species one, two, three, four, five, and, and the percentages for the overstory and the same thing for the understory. Um, you can also visualize some of the data because Excel is great at some of the visualizations. So for example, for two taper, just put it together very quickly that you can, you can look at, for example, diameter inside dark, which is three taper over various natural subregions. Like this is central mixed wood, suburb, pine, mountain, upper foothills, lower foothills in this case. 
And this is, of course, a distorted graph because it shows you the line areas, uh, you know, instead of just the radius. But you get the point. It just gives you an idea. And, and in this case, you can select different species. If you use the birch, for example, uh, there is obviously only one. I think Shani has one equation for that one. Or you can build more sophisticated stuff depending on what your level of comfort with Excel is. Like I built, although it looks kind of daunting maybe, uh, it, it isn't. It's actually one formula that was just copied down. It copied the tree size um, based on tree, piece size based on trees per cubic meter and the user can select their own species. And as they do, um, you know, the numbers change and that, that's kind of the idea. And you can use different utilization limits and whatnot. So, so it's, it's a good way of um, building more sophisticated applications. Um, and I mean, I, I include one more just as an example, and that's the compiler. Um, you could envision this one as something that you want to do a recce cruise or whatnot, and, and you have some stands and you want to put in three plots, each of them are 100 square, uh, square meters in this case. And you have a certain utilization limit, and you kind of, well, in this case, it assumes you're not collecting height. You could make it more complicated by being able to use heights, uh, measured heights versus predicted ones. But in this case, all the heights are predicted and uh, per hectare factors and base area and all this. And these are all dynamic. So if you change your um, plot size, then obviously the per hectare factors change and everything else. And these are all just FTBX formulas. Uh, so base area, growth merchant volume, base area per hectare, this is a multiplication, obviously, and, and, and all those. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way of um, you know, quickly prototyping a, a compiler. And in this case, I include also a, I guess, a statistics on the, on the very end. And, and this also has something that might be useful to show in this case, you can see this is a unique function. A unique function in Excel essentially could provide you a unique list of species. So it will be dynamic depending on what species are in your, obviously in your, in, in your particular stand. And, and this expands or, 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 or you know, shrinks based on whatever that particular stand has. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to build something like this, uh, especially if you are you know, a moderately sophisticated user. And, you know, it, it will provide information that uh, that's useful to you. And, you know, you can print out like a very com convenient way of a, a one pager of this particular stand and gives you all the statistics and everything else. You could include additional statistics that are related to this, or you can collate, inform col uh, you know, collate information with, uh, if you have many stands, uh, the point is that it gives you a quick and dirty way of doing stuff uh, without having to, you know, go through the more complicated route of, of, of software development. So um, let's go back to this. Um, so what's the future? Um, I guess, if, uh, as I said, I always consider this as a phase one where you can show people what's possible as opposed to a kind of a blank page. And, and if it's useful, um, you know, there's several ways to, to extend this. One of them is use a specific profile and customization. So if you are an FMA holder and, and you have your specific approved utilization limits that you want to use as a default, so you don't have to specify it every time, you know, there would be a way of doing that. So, you know, when you, you know, install your add-in, it, ask for the customization information and you put that in once and it will remember. You can embed more complex functions. Um, log merchandising is probably the most useful one for many people. You know how many logs are in a tree and you can do pencil blocking other, other strategies, uh, different log rules. Or, um, you can implement mixed effect models. Some develop these and I believe they are very useful, but also because of partial deriv derivatives and other goodies in math, generally they are um, pretty much inaccessible to most people for that reason. We were just working on a project with maximum size density and spacing and commercial thinning. Uh, that would be very useful to implement some of those functions um, so they're directly available to users. 
when it comes to RSA data, which is the civic, uh, sorry, uh, performance survey data in Alberta, it also comes in CSV files and people do have trouble with that. There would be a way of providing easy solution to cleaning and formatting that data so it goes right into the compiler. And I guess the, the, the last thing about, I, I want to mention is um, uh, something called the lambda function. And, and this lambda function is, is coming. Um, Excel about five years ago, I was not sure where this is going to go, uh, Microsoft's plan. But essentially, a new guy who got to the development team there uh, took, took this whole thing uh, to a new level. And they started to do a lot of research and development and really looking at certain things. And one of them is called this lambda function, which essentially is a function of functions. And, and, and what, what that means from a user's perspective that um, right now, one of the limitations of all this is that you have to have some sort of a laptop or a surface computer to take it out to the field because, um, because we be a macros where this stuff is written and embedded in that native Excel is not um, supported on mobile devices. With the Lambda functions, essentially one can write um, worksheet functions without VBA code. And the moment that happens, uh, that's gonna open a whole new world because then all these functions that you have here could could become available on mobile devices and tablets without having to carry a computer with you and or, or as I said, a surface computer. So that will provide additional, I guess, ammunition. Um, there are other ideas as well, but I guess these are kind of the way I see things um, in terms of where this could be taken. And we are already on the web, thanks to Brian. Um, and, uh, and the Evergrow team. And it's just a, basically a place where there's some short description and also, um, you know, basically you can download the software from right from there. And my contact information is here. Um, and I guess the, the last thing is that I, I'd like to thank everyone who attended this. And also if you have any feedback or questions, um, you know, this is the time to do it.